Uh, thank you for coming to this constitutional uh, conversation. I'm Robert Weisberg. I teach uh, at Stanford Law School. And I just want to say that uh, it would have been very exciting to come merely as a spectator to hear Oren Kerr talk about this important subject, but I'm even more excited because I get to introduce him. And I'm, uh, it's an honor for me. Uh, uh, professor Kerr uh, is currently professor of law at UC Berkeley. He's taught at such other distinguished law schools as GW and uh, Southern Cal. Uh, and uh, I want to say something about his special eminence as relevant uh, to this field. Uh, uh, professor Kerr, I think of as a kind of ambassador between two worlds, uh, a bridger, because uh, there are lots of things about the Fourth Amendment that aren't about electronic surveillance and the digital world, but an increasing part of the study, the case law in, in this area, is really about uh, the technological world. And uh, Professor Kerr uh, is pretty unusual for having a significant background in, uh, in the technology world. I believe the original degree was in mechanical and aerospace engineering, which sounds very sci-fi-ish. But uh, he, among all uh, scholars of criminal procedure, is the best at helping explain, I assume, explain law to the engineers. But he's certainly uh, the great star of explaining engineering to lawyers in the sense of giving us a handle, including us lay people, on what the relevant parts of technology are, what the components of it are, what the consequences of it are, and connecting it to this world of legal doctrine, most of which arose without any awareness of technology. Uh, we know that uh, you know, there are some areas of technology and law that are statutory. I guess you could use wiretap as an example. But uh, some of the most difficult questions involve uh, this very old fashioned legal reasoning where we take Fourth Amendment doctrines that were about, you know, reaching into people's pockets or opening drawers and things like that or opening boxes and having to apply them by this bizarre set of legal metaphors to the digital world. What does it mean to search a hard drive? And Professor Kerr has written all the great articles, as far as I'm concerned, are the most important articles on how this translation can work, number one, what it means, but number two, with a, a great deal of normative wisdom about how they should work. Uh, and his subject today is going to be about borders, and I'll just say one more thing about that, and that is borders are sort of a special area. Uh, you might say that they are now sort of a Fourth Amendment free zone or a no Fourth Amendment zone. That's not entirely true, but they're part of this mixture of factors or situations in our world where uh, supposedly the normal rules of probable cause and search warrants and all that might be, have to be relaxed because of, to use that term, we see sometimes special needs, special circumstances, and so on. So that the law in this area is a lot of balancing. A lot of things go into the Cuisinart. But one of the most interesting things is start with the border, which is, of course, uh, a place where you know, or now our default is to believe you have no rights at all, but map that onto the digital world where uh, with Carpenter and other cases, we're seeing increasing protection. And where does the, I won't say the Cuisinart anymore, where does the catalysis, well, there's a good pompous term of these different arenas come together. So there's no better person uh, to point us to uh, what the future might bring and what the future should bring than Professor Kerr. And uh, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you much, uh, so much, Professor Weisberg. This was wonderful uh, to be here, and thank you for um, uh, hosting. And it's great to at least virtually be at Stanford. Uh, I I actually uh, have a degree in a graduate degree in mechanical engineering from from Stanford. And uh, when I left uh, California to go back east for law school, I kind of scratched my head and I said, "Why am I leaving California?" <laughs> <laughs> so it took a while. Eventually, I came back. Um, uh, and it's uh, great to be in, in the area. So, so here's the here's the. I'm going to tell you where I'm going, and then I'll I'll hopefully take you there. Um, the Supreme Court is in the middle of trying to consider how Fourth Amendment doctrine applies to computers, computer searches, and the like. And there's an issue that they're probably going to get to in a year or two that lower courts are dividing on, which is how should the Fourth Amendment apply at the border to digital searches? And this comes up uh, often when people are crossing the border and every day almost 
a million people cross the United States border, either the Mexico border, the Canadian border, or flying in and out um, uh, at, uh, into an airport or out of an airport. Uh, and the government wants to search a digital device that a person is carrying. And the number of these searches has been dramatically increasing over the last few years. In 2019, about 40,000 computer searches occurred uh, at the border pursuant uh, to these special border rules. And as Professor uh, Weisberg uh, pointed out a moment ago, um, the traditional approach to the Fourth Amendment at the border is pretty close to saying there are no Fourth Amendment limits at the border. Searching property has essentially been allowed without limit um, on the ground that the government has heightened interest at the border in, in basically doing three different things. First, uh, looking for immigration violations, that is people that might be trying to enter the United States that aren't supposed to be uh, entering the United States. And so the government has to have a special search authority to check to make sure that's not happening or to try to stop that from happening. Uh, and then second, people might be uh, importing contraband into the United States, or in some cases, exporting uh, items that are not supposed to uh, be exported. And that is maybe drugs, for example, that might be coming in from outside of the United States. And the government has a sovereign interest in protecting its borders and keeping that stuff out, or in some cases, keeping it in. Um, uh, and, then, and then finally, the government may have an interest just in making sure that taxes are paid uh, on items that the government is supposed to, that the government is taxing. And at the founding of the United States, that was the primary source of revenue uh, for the national government. And so there's a historical interest in making sure if you're importing something from England and you're importing your tea and you're supposed to pay your taxes, pay those taxes. And so the government has a search authority there. And the modern Supreme Court case law comes close to giving the, uh, uh, border authorities, plenary, complete authority. There are a few things they can't do. They can't do physical body cavity searches without reasonable suspicion, which is not a warrant, but is some sort of particularized suspicion. And then there may be some other particularly invasive searches that occur, but the ordinary rule for property uh, is that property crossing the border can be searched. And the question I have is how or whether should this doctrine apply to computer searches when people are crossing the border and they just happen to have their cell phones with them uh, because they carry their cell phones almost attached to their bodies uh, at all times, or they have a laptop or a thumb drive or whatever it may be in terms of digital storage devices. What makes this interesting is the broader question of how the Supreme Court has responded to new technologies. Uh, and so I think that the Supreme Court actually has had a methodology for responding to new technologies that explains a lot of Supreme Court case law on the Fourth Amendment that might at first not seem related, uh, which is that what tends to happen is we have these Fourth Amendment rules about what the government can do that were stable for the 18th century where we had you know, houses and physical intrusions, as, as was mentioned earlier, rifling through pockets, opening drawers, entering physical places. Um, and in that world, we had a sort of rough balance of privacy protection where if it was outside, the government could see it, but if it was inside, the government needed a warrant to break in. Um, and that sort of led to us relative stability. This is sort of the common law rules of, of search and seizure. And then the evolution occurs naturally as new technologies arise and new social facts arise and ways of committing crimes change and then ways of investigating crime change and those prior rules may seem like they no longer make any sense at all given the new dynamic of how crimes occur and what what ends up happening is you get a concern of two dystopias uh, that might occur first it might be that under the old rules the government uh, has unlimited power or a great enhancement of power, not because we decided to give them more power, but because the technology has evolved in a way such that applying the old rules to the new technologies leads to a dramatically different level of power, expanding government power, or it can be the opposite. Sometimes the old rules apply them to the new facts, uh, leads to an odd results where we're worried about the dystopia of the government not having enough power, people be able to commit crimes and not be detected. And what the Supreme Court has tended to do in cases going back um, along well over 100 years is, is, is engage in what I've called, given the fancy academic title of equilibrium adjustment, which is basically say, this is a new technological world. We need to adjust the rules for this new environment. 
We might adjust what is a search to account for wiretapping. We might account for what requires a warrant to account, for example, for cars in the use of crime. Um, and across the board in a whole bunch of different constitutional doctrines, the justices end up being pretty attuned to changes in technology and they introduce a new rule for that technology. And then what at the time looked like a new technology quickly becomes just sort of a backdrop old technology. People don't even think about it like a technology. And we end up with these very specific isolated sets of rules with different categories of constitutional cases. Maybe the best example of this or one that's current for um, uh, if you've studied any Fourth Amendment law, you'll know that there's a, a, a sort of a separate category of Fourth Amendment cases, car cases. There's the automobile exception, and there are you know search incident to arrest for a car, and there's every there's just there's a separate we just have car cases, and and the evolution of car cases is a reflection of this recurring dynamic of cases involving crime and cars. You know, evidence in the 1920s it was contraband being carried in the back of cars, uh, and you had the justices of the Supreme Court try to figure out what do we do with our old rules, which were basically it, a warrant is required to conduct a search or it's not a search at all, like an on off switch. And in the 1920s, the justices were very worried about how are you going to enforce the prohibition laws if the rule is a warrant is needed to search a car? Because anybody could put their booze in the back of their Model T. And if a warrant is required, how you, you, the officer stops the car by the side of the road 20 miles out of town, you can't find a judge. And so in, in that environment, the justices in the, in the starting in the 1920s create the automobile exception and the sort of specific rule for cars reflecting what they perceived as the reality of trying to restore the balance of police power given how cars were, um, uh, the technology itself was making it hard to enforce the law under the prior rules. And so we get kind of car cases under the Fourth Amendment. And so my basic uh, uh, framework is to think about uh, computers as kind of the 21st century version of this. And I think we're beginning to see the creation of a what I call the digital Fourth Amendment uh, computer rules and the computer rules will be to the 21st century Fourth Amendment what the car rules were for the 20th century Fourth Amendment because we had just recurring fact patterns within completely new dynamics uh, uh, of, of how, how crimes are committed and most importantly where evidence is and how the government might try to collect that evidence. Uh, we've seen an example of this and here's the case I think that really um, is is the is the best one to think about uh, when you approach the border search exception, uh, which is the search incident to arrest exception, uh, which is the traditional rule that when the government makes an arrest, they're allowed to search the person, all the property on their person, um, without any additional warrant, without any cause. Just search allows a search or arrest allows search incident to arrest, and this got to the Supreme Court uh, in Riley versus California in 2014 where the justices had to ask, does the search incident to arrest power apply to cell phones? So in the 1970s, when the Supreme Court really sort of puts its stamp on the search incident to arrest doctrine for people, there are no cell phones. And the court says, well, it's you know, reasonable to have a rule that everyone can be searched um, I I implicit with the arrest. And then by 2014, we're in a totally different technological world where suddenly everyone's carrying a cell phone and that goes from a flip phone to a smartphone really quickly. And by 2014, even though smartphones were only like seven or eight years old, most Americans all of a sudden were carrying these smartphones. Uh, and the justices had to figure out, does this traditional doctrine apply to digital searches too? And from the law enforcement standpoint, they thought this was like fantastic if the rule did apply uh, to uh, uh, digital devices because they could arrest somebody based on probable cause and automatically be able to search their cell phone, which is just an incredible, massive trove of information. And so the government could pretextually arrest somebody and then grab that cell phone and start looking for evidence. What does the Supreme Court do? Well, they unanimously conclude that the search incident to arrest exception does not apply to digital devices. And the court's reasoning, they say, we, the, just the digital dynamics are so different, we need to ask ourselves, what are the purposes served by this doctrine, searching incident to arrest, and does it apply in the digital evidence setting? And we need to think of this as just completely 
a new problem. We have the doctrine has to rest on its own bottom as it applies to the new dynamics of, of digital searches. And in the context of search incident to arrest, the traditional role of that doctrine had been to protect officer safety. What if the person arrested is carrying a gun? Uh, and also to preserve evidence of the crime. You know, what if the person, for example, has more drugs in, on their person at the time they're arrested for a drug offense, they might sort of get rid of the drugs. And so the officer should be able to grab those drugs in order to make sure that they don't uh, get thrown away and, and are lost. So the court in Riley basically asks, okay, how do those rationales apply to the distinct category of digital evidence, or as the court sort of thinks of it as cell phones as a distinct thing. And the court says, well, the, digital, the, the officer safety rationale doesn't apply. It's not like there's going to be physical, there's not going to be a gun in the phone. And also the, dig, the, the evidence preservation concern can be satisfied by just grabbing the phone and putting it in airplane mode or putting it in a Faraday bag, sort of preventing it from being accessed remotely. And that therefore the, the warrant requirement should apply to digital searches, in, especially in light of the um, scope of computer searches. They're just so much more invasive uh, than the search of physical evidence on a person because in their pockets, there's only so much stuff you can have, but you can have libraries worth of information and very personal information on a cell phone. So Riley says, okay, we step back, we think about our rationales and we apply the fourth amendment distinctly given the new dynamics to digital evidence and to cell phones. And that's, that's the, the precedent that I think really kind of should lead the way here in thinking about the border search exception. Why? Because let's think about our rationales for the border search exception. Well, the first one was preventing illegal immigration. Uh, and, and much like the officer safety rationale in Riley, there's not going to be a person hidden in the phone, just like there's not going to be a gun hidden in the phone. The sort of inherently um, uh, uh, intangible, uh, 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 non-physical aspect of data means that that concern doesn't seem to apply. Um, and then similarly, we're not really concerned about um, not being able to pay taxes on the data uh, because data ordinarily is not something that's going to be itself independently taxed. Um, uh, and, and, and that really, I think, leads the contraband rationale. How about keeping out contraband? And, and here, there is a rationale in terms of keeping contraband out. In particular, instead of drugs, the digital contraband is going to be uh, uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material, also known as child pornography. And the government may have an interest in protecting and preventing child pornography from entering the United States or from, I could in theory be exiting the United States, but really from entering the United States. What about that rationale? Does that sort of justify um, uh, a search power? And I think uh, I, my, my argument is that actually the way that digital evidence works makes that government interest very modest in the context of purely digital uh, evidence in the following sense. With physical things have to be in a physical place and can only be in one place at a time. So when we talk about physical contraband, think like you know, cocaine being imported from Colombia or something like that. Um, that is something that is being originating in a place and the government in trying to keep it out of the country naturally will look to the border because it has to cross the border in order to enter and it can only be in one place. And so catching drugs at the border is a genuine way of preventing the importation of drugs into the country. And, and I think the physicality of physical evidence makes that border contraband rationale a, a pretty strong one. On the other hand, I think digital evidence just works differently and digital files work differently. The nature of digital files is they can be anywhere, uh, they can be copied endlessly, and they can be zipped around the world in an instant without any physicality aspect of it. And I think that is a critical conceptual difference in weakening the government interest in preventing contraband from entering the United States. In the abstract, it's true that there's a non-zero government interest in preventing digital contraband, uh, uh, CSAM, from entering the United States. But as a practical matter, that interest is so modest that what the government is really doing when it's searching physical devices at the border, cell phones, laptops, it's not to prevent contraband from coming in. 
is to identify crimes committed by the people who are carrying the devices. That is, what's the government really worried about? They're worried about the person who's engaged in child sex trafficking or some uh, criminal offense who might be crossing the border, uh, you know, um, um, coming back to the United States after uh, uh, being on some sort of a trip abroad, for example, or somebody who um, uh, has a history or a prior conviction for a related offense. They're using the border search exception as an opportunity to get into devices to see if there's evidence that relates to those crimes. But what the real goal is, is identifying the people who are criminals and convicting them rather than of preventing the data from coming in. And you can see this in part also just think, you know, if someone is really worried about the government um, monitoring at the border, what can they do? They can, they can you know, uh, uh, delete all the files on their devices, load them to the cloud in an encrypted form, cross the border, and then download it to their devices uh, all remotely. The government will never see anything at the border. It'll never cross the physical border in some sort of physical form. And that's an alternative method of getting the information. What we what we we really we care about the information, and we but we care primarily about the people who might want to access the information more than the location of the data on the internet being an essential part of government sovereignty, which I think it would be in the context of physical evidence. So I think the rationale of the border search exception just doesn't really apply um, uh, in a strong form to. Uh, uh, to digital searches. And I think the, the, where that pushes me is sort of to, to say, well, the, the Riley rationale of saying this exception to the warrant requirement, or it just, it, that rationale doesn't seem to work anymore for digital files is equally the case with respect to the border search exception as it is to searching incident to arrest. Now, let me add a couple caveats to that and, and, and talk a little bit about some areas where uh, uh, this, this might be a little bit uncertain. One is that I think it may, it's, it's probably uh, justifiable that there's a different rule with respect to people who don't have voluntary contacts in the United States as individuals. Uh, and this goes back to a Supreme Court case from about 30 years ago called United States versus Verdugo or Quides. Uh, and the Supreme Court in that case was a splinter decision, but kind of the gist of it is that you only have Fourth Amendment rights if you have legitimate voluntary contacts with the United States, you're a US citizen, you're a permanent resident alien, uh, you are a visitor who has been welcomed into the United States, you sort of have enough contacts. Um, and, and, and I think that rule would remain important in the context of uh, digital device searches in that if the person does not have Fourth Amendment rights, it doesn't seem to make sense that they somehow get rights by virtue of carrying a digital device. Um, and that would require courts to start explaining exactly when, as somebody approaches the border or when they're invited into the country or when they've sort of crossed through customs, um, when they start to get Fourth Amendment rights. That's a question that the courts have never had to answer because the rule right now is basically that no one gets Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, and so if even a US citizen is told like you total search at the border, you don't have to draw the line of exactly when someone might gain Fourth Amendment rights as they approach the border. Um, but I think what um, uh, under, under the approach uh, that I'm proposing, a warrant requirement would continue to exist for searching digital devices of those with Fourth Amendment rights. And then you would have to come up with lines as to exactly when Fourth Amendment rights would kick in, the end result of which might be that people don't have Fourth Amendment rights when they are for, you know, crossing the border as outsiders to the US and then until they're sort of formally welcomed into the United States, uh, but that US citizens would still continue and permanent resident aliens and the like would continue to have full, full Fourth Amendment rights at the border. Um, two other wrinkles to kind of ponder. One is how this, uh, whether the full rule here should be a warrant requirement or alternatively some kind of reasonableness regime. And th this gets into kind of the interesting question of how the Fourth Amendment applies outside the United States. And so a bunch of Supreme Courts never addressed this, but lower courts have said there's no warrant requirement outside the United States. There's usually no you know, district court of the District of Scotland or whatever it might be to go get a warrant. And so Usually US authorities will be working with foreign law enforcement to conduct foreign searches. And the lower courts have said in that setting, while well, US citizens, permanent resident aliens still have constitutional rights, but the standard is reasonableness. And maybe that's 
following foreign law because that's kind of what you'd expect or want and in how investigations should go. Um, and so there's interesting questions of when does reasonableness end and when does the warrant requirement start? I mean, I think just intuitively the natural answer would be like once you're physically in the United States, which would be, you know, inside the border checkpoint, the government can get a warrant at that point. And so maybe that's when the warrant requirement applies. But there's at least kind of a line, just like there's a starting line drawing question of when should people start to get their Fourth Amendment rights, there's a war reasonableness versus warrant requirement issue, which would also need to be answered. Uh, and then the, just the last thing to, to talk about is I think you, one question naturally would come up was like, well, does that mean that people can just like, um, uh, uh, you know, people engaged in criminal activity that are crossing the border with their devices, does that mean the government has no authority to detain them or no authority to stop them or no authority to search? Uh, and here, I think, again, Riley is pretty sound guidance, which is Riley says that searching incident to arrest, the government can search the person and seize the the, the storage device sees the cell phone and hold on to that. They just need a warrant in order to search it. And so at the border, the government would still have, under my proposal, the government would still have the authority to uh, seize the device. Uh, so they would sort of benefit in that sense from being able to grab the device. They just wouldn't be able to search it without the warrant. And there are interesting questions of how long the government should be able to hold on to someone's property. Um, and that 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 is a, also kind of an unresolved question in the border search setting now that, that would need to be worked out. Is it sort of the usual rules, which is the government can hold on to property for just a little bit until they get a warrant, but they can't kind of just hold on to it for a while? Or should there be something different because it's the border? That I think still something I, I, I'm not entirely sure of where I come out on that. Uh, but the end result, I think, is that uh, that the Supreme Court should uh, conclude that the uh, border search exception does not apply, at least for those that have Fourth Amendment rights. Um, and this this probably will be teed up in the next uh, year or two. I think there's a there's a lower court disagreement as to what the standard is, is you know creating the circuit split that often prompts U.S. Supreme Court review. Uh, with some circuits saying the Fourth Amendment applies to digital evidence just like it does to physical evidence, we just have a rule for stuff and we're going to apply those rules and that means no requirement. Some circuits, the Ninth Circuit has said there's a special rule for forensic searches, more sort of in-depth complex searches through a digital storage device requiring some amount of suspicion. Um, and, and the Supreme Court actually had an opportunity to take one of these cases. The Justice Department uh, petitioned for certiorari asking the Supreme Court to resolve some of this split. And the Supreme Court said no, which was interesting because usually when the Justice Department calls and they come with a circuit split, usually the Supreme Court's pretty interested. I think it was a good thing that the Supreme Court didn't step in, in part because the initial split is over sort of no cause versus some amount of cause. And I think ultimately the choices should be a lot wider than that. And that you know, it, it, maybe the justices are waiting for one circuit to say uh, no border search exception following a Riley-like approach, and then the justices will take the case. But it's 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 queued up and ready to go um, with just a few more circuits uh, uh, in a position to weigh in. But we'll probably be seeing a Supreme Court case that takes on these issues uh, relatively soon. Uh, okay, well, that's the basic talk. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Kerr. That was really interesting. Um, I'll kick it off. You guys, anyone in the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will do my best to do justice to asking your question. Um, but in the meantime, I, I will start off with a minor question. You alluded to Cotterman, which is the Ninth Circuit case that established that government agents have to have reasonable suspicion before they do a forensic examination of uh, computer devices at the border. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the rule that you're proposing relates to Cotterman. Is it, are, are you essentially extending it or can you distinguish what you're talking about from, from Cotterman? Yeah, so the, the Cotterman uh, uh, case from the Ninth Circuit a couple of different things. One thing it did is draw a distinction between manual searches and forensic searches. It didn't define exactly what the line is between those two, although the Fourth Circuit has sort of talked more about this um, as being a difference between using the operating system, like, like you might, let's say you're looking for a file that you had last year and you go up into, you know, whatever the search function is of your operating system and you look for files that way, 
Um, that's a manual search as compared to a forensic search, which would be attaching outside forensic software, which can look at like all the files and look in the hidden parts of the computer and what files that maybe you thought were deleted but weren't deleted. Uh, and so the Connerman case said, well, a, for a manual search, that's like a traditional kind of search. And so we'll allow that without any cause, but the forensic searches are sort of extra invasive and will re will require reasonable suspicion for that. Um, and so my approach is, is, is sort of, I sort of think it way beyond that, I guess, is a way of thinking about it. In part, I think the manual forensic distinction, first, I don't think it's a, a, a distinction that really uh, uh, can withstand technological change. What can be done through a manual search versus what can be done with a forensic search just depends on the current operating systems and the current forensic tools. And who knows how those are going to evolve. You could have an operating system evolve in a way that it allows forensic search capabilities, and then it truly makes no difference which one you're, you're dealing with. So I don't think that's a, a viable uh, line. I also think that it's not the degree of invasiveness so much is the issue as the nature of intangible evidence not really being able to fit the sovereignty rationale of the border search exception. So even if the government can conduct a manual search, you know, go open someone's laptop, go into the search function and say, you know, give me all the JPEG files. The, first of all, that can still be really, really invasive. And then second, it's not really furthering the interest of the border search exception, given the nature of, of digital evidence. So, so I, I, I think there's a similar theme in that what Cotterman was trying to do was also trying to come up with rules that recognize the new facts of computer searches. But I, I just, end up sort of being taken to a different place and maybe a more dramatic place than the somewhat of a middle ground that Cotterman struck. Thanks. Um, just as an aside, I, I believe that our, our Q&A function might have been disabled for the, some of the participants. So if that was an issue, it should be resolved now. So please go ahead and read any question that you may have had that that didn't go through. So sorry about that. Um, but I have received other questions through other technological means because these devices are ubiquitous. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, read one of them uh, to you. OK, um, so one of our audience members says, I think his answer on computer searches has to be correct. Two questions. Number one, what level of cause does he propose for seizing the computer to then seek a search warrant on? Is no level of suspicion necessary? And then the second question is for, for, for the courts that have given carte blanche for computer searches at the border, what reason or reasons have those courts given? Ooh, two good questions. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that there would need to be an authority to seize the device at the border, although this really connects to how long the device can be seized question because lower, most, Lower courts, and also there have been some Supreme Court cases on this, have said in the context of physical evidence, the government needs reasonable suspicion for a short detention and probable cause for a longer detention. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not sure that there actually needs to be a separate cause requirement for seizing the device um, as compared to searching it if the rule is that a warrant is needed to search it. Um, but that may depend on how long you say the seizure can occur. So I guess this is all a complicated way of saying, I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't gotten that far in the argument, but it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and in terms of what the, the lower courts have said that have um, uh, said that the government has carte blanche at the border for digital, they basically just said, this is, the Supreme Court has answered this. They've said property searches are okay. Uh, and the, you know, for example, and, United States versus Flores Montano, a case from 2003, the court said that the uh, government can take apart a car, take apart the gas tank of a car, uh, and it'll take a couple hours and require, you know, a, a lifting up the car and taking out the gas tank and all that. They were looking for drugs and they found drugs uh, uh, in that case without any suspicion. And as long as it didn't take more than a few hours, kind of no big deal, didn't damage the car too much, that's all fine. And so I think lower court judges look at that and you know they're thinking like that's pretty invasive. That's a pretty big deal just just by virtue of crossing the border. Well, if that's the rule for property, that should also apply to computers. And I, I think I think some of this is that um, 
treating computers as a separate category in Fourth Amendment law is, you know, Riley suggests you should, but some lower courts would understandably look at Riley and say, that's just about the search incident to arrest exception. That's not like a general rule for all Fourth Amendment law. And so we're, we're, we're too early in maybe the, what I hope will be the creation of uh, digital Fourth Amendment rules for that to be an, an, an across the board reaction that we need to sort of think about this from first principles. Professor Weisberg, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, just a couple of questions, uh, Oren, going back to your, your fundamental points, some really interesting ones. First about uh, what you might call the futility or the pointlessness of uh, intercepting contraband when the contraband exists in other forms that could easily be made so. Uh, how distinctive is that argument about borders in the sense that maybe a similar argument could be made about the futility of the other means of getting at child porn, you know, once inside the borders somewhere in the United States. How categorical a distinction is that? I guess that bears on the question of how child porn is, how and why child porn is investigated. The flip side of it though, what I, what I found really, uh, uh, really intriguing uh, was your point that, well, they're not really going after the thing, they're going after the person. And I, I think that's a fabulous insight. Again, I wonder how focused that is on border searches because I, you know, you can think of lots of other forms of uh, things that come up under the Fourth Amendment. Just going back to Terry and armed and dangerous and all that, where one could say that what's really going on is not the desire to intercept, uh, to get property or contraband, but to somehow get a dangerous person into the system somehow. Yeah, and I, I guess um, maybe the answer depends on how seriously you take the Supreme Court's proffered justifications for various doctrines. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the court will always say, here's the reason why we have this rule, here's the government interest, and here's the privacy interest, and we balance them in some particular way, or we, we consider them a certain way, and, and here's the rule that emerges. And I'm, when I'm going about this, I'm, I'm taking that proffer justification super seriously. Um, and, and another way of looking at it would be to say, well, they don't really necessarily, you know, mean that we can, we, we can maybe be more skeptical about the rationales more broadly. And, and, and so in that sense, I'm offering kind of an internal doctrinal framework, which I think matches the broader equilibrium adjustment rationale, but is, is something that would sort of operate doctrine by doctrine to create different rules in some settings and not other settings and kind of adjust internally to those explanations. We have a couple of SCOTUS related questions, one of which is sort of funny. Um, one person asks, do you have a prediction as to how the Supreme Court might rule on these issues? And then someone else says, do you ever worry that you're too influential with the Supreme Court? <laughs> Uh, ladder, no. Um, what was the what was the first question again? Uh, Do you have a prediction as to how the court may rule? You had indicated that you thought the court might take up these questions uh, the next couple of years. Um, it's really hard to predict. Um, you know, it's interesting. On one hand, you have cases like Riley, which is nine zero. You have Carpenter, which, depending on how you count it, was. Um, uh, pretty closely divided, maybe five, four, maybe six, three, depending on how you how you count. But um, so I, I, you know, and then you also have a different court today than there was uh, a few years ago. So it's I think it's really hard to count votes on on this uh, question. Um, it, it, it's it's yeah, I think it's I think it's just really hard given that we don't know all all the justices trying to figure this out. I think there's going to be interest in this. I think the fact that the court didn't grant cert. In the court, in the Cano case, which the Justice Department petitioned, um, that kind of suggests that they're looking to at the big picture, sort of long term, and waiting, which maybe is a good sign that they're going to kind of think about this from first principles. But it's it's just too early to tell, I think. Another interesting question, I think, about the sort of relationship between the Fifth and Fourth Amendment um, at the border. This person who like me has taken a criminal law class with Professor Weisberg says, if I remember correctly from Professor Weisberg's class, there's a weird interaction between the fourth and fifth amendment or being forced to say or write your password violates your fifth amendment privilege against self-incrimination since saying or writing your password 
is considered testimonial evidence, but being forced to press your finger against your phone to unlock it is not testimonial evidence, and thus is not protected by either the Fourth or Fifth Amendment. Has this kind of argument come up in border cases, and does the Fifth Amendment ever come up in digital searches at the border? Yeah, so there's uh, state Supreme Court splits on both the uh, disclose a password cases and on the um, being compelled to enter in a passcode cases. I'm trying to think if any of them recently have involved the border. Historically, some did, but I think the recent ones have been all um, um, uh, just just routine U.S based domestic criminal cases. Um, and so there's a state Supreme Court split and I suspect the US Supreme Court will address how the Fifth Amendment applies. Um, um, there's not yet a split on the biometric question. I doubt there will be because I think that one has a pretty clear answer. And I actually think that that line makes a lot of sense. And the, the hard, hard question is how to apply the um, Fifth Amendment privilege to the unlocking, compelled unlocking and compelled entry. Another, uh, what that re also raises is to what extent should the basic equilibrium adjustment idea apply to the Fifth Amendment? Is it a, do you sort of treat a, the, the general shift in dynamic as applying broadly, or is that just for Fourth Amendment law? And where that becomes really interesting is that we haven't had an environment where everyone was walking around with a device that's really hard to get into. Um, just by default, because that's what you buy at the Apple store or you buy at the mall or something like that. Um, and so, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see if the justices, when they get this case, which probably will also be within a year or two, um, whether they see that as a relevant consideration formally, or maybe they feel it important, but they don't want to say it, and we don't know. Um, and, and there's also really interesting questions lurking with the Fifth Amendment issues, because the application of the law today on this question is caught up in a set of doctrines involving the act of production doctrine, which some of you may be familiar with if you've taken criminal procedure, um, which, which has been questioned uh, on originalist grounds by several justices. Uh, Thomas and Gorsuch have uh, expressly said they don't, they're not sure this is right and would be open to rethinking it. So when the unlocking a cell phone issue gets to the Supreme Court, it's gonna be both a kind of what makes sense, what fits old doctrine, and should we rethink old doctrine at the same time? So that, that's gonna be a really fun case um, in, this, in this field um, coming to the Supreme Court probably pretty soon. There are a couple of questions that touch on how folks might use different types of technologies to get around the legal requirements and that you're talking about. So one, one question is, if a different standard applies to search or to seizure rather than search, wouldn't people evade searches by building in auto destruct features into their devices that would just invoke themselves after a certain amount of time? Yeah, I mean, people could, they could also just use burner phones or delete all their files on their devices um, separately, uh, or, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of ways around this if people are really dedicated to doing this and I, I, to, to, to doing so. And I, I actually think that's part of why the rationale, the border search exception doesn't really fit this scenario, because if it, it's, it's not really about preventing the contraband, it's about gathering evidence. So the question becomes, well, if you're trying to bring evidence in or something that the government might wrongly perceive as evidence, how do you work around that? And so, so I think the fact that this becomes sort of a relevant direction to take is yet another sort of echoes this point that the basic rationale doesn't, should, shouldn't apply. But, but um, I mean, I, it, it could in theory be the, be the case that, um, uh, uh, that that's true. Although I guess if the government has reason to think someone has used some sort of an auto delete function that might create exigent circumstances to permit the warrantless search of the device. So that that may cut the opposite way if you're if you're a, a Fourth Amendment uh, if you're if you're thinking of Fourth Amendment law before bringing your devices across the border maybe it's maybe it's the uh, uh, you don't want to do that or at least make sure there are no signs of that uh, available. Um, but if there is actually a warrant requirement and the warrant requirement you you need, you need to think about you know presumably it, it would there would need to be cause in order to detain uh, the device at some point and cause to search it. And if that's the case, there's no sort of obvious advantage the government would have in holding on to the device for a while. I mean, I guess it depends 
it could be if they can hold on to it for a long time to try to get probable cause, it becomes an issue. So, so again, that's part of it. I haven't quite worked out. And, and I think that answer may depend on how that, how that goes. Another related question that's very specific on the, the concern about um, people crossing borders and using uh, micro SD cards sealed in small metal, uh, kind of a small metal case to house sensitive trade secrets. Would we not require a warrant for you know border search, government officials searching at the border who maybe identify that particular device and sort of believe that it's probably something suspicious or how you know how would that particular case play out under your under your approach yeah under my approach in the same way as it would with a cell phone so if it's a u.s citizen or person with fourth amendment rights crossing the border and the government thinks it's suspicious then they can get a warrant to search it um, uh, and if it's somebody who has no Fourth Amendment rights, they could search it without a warrant, but it would be kind of warrant or no warrant um, rather than some lower degree of suspicion. Got it. Um, we have a couple of questions about your thoughts on specific cases. So if you'd like to be cold called, then we'll do that now. So first, <laughs> um, someone in the audience is curious if you could talk about your views on the contraband discussion in uh, Cano, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And that, um, I guess the they're talking about, I presume they're talking about US v. Cano where the cert petition was denied uh, last year. And, and what was it, the contraband discussion in the opinion, is that? Presumably in the case, in the Ninth Circuit case below, um, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about. So just for our for our uh, audience, um, the issue in the, in the case, the cert was denied before the Supreme Court. The issue there was whether the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit erred in concluding that the scope of a search of an electronic device under the border search exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement is limited solely to digital contraband on the device itself and cannot include evidence of physical smuggling or other border related crimes. Again, the Supreme Court didn't take that up, but this is the, uh, presumably the audience members asking about the Ninth Circuit case. Yes, I, I think of Cano as a case that shows the mess that you're in if you try to carve some middle ground in this area. So the Supreme Court in Co or the Supreme Court in Cotterman, the lower Ninth Circuit in Cotterman had said no cause for manual searches, reasonable suspicion um, for forensic searches. And then in Cano, you end up having to do with what do you do if it's like manual search, manual search, forensic search, and then are there any limits on manual searches? And then the, the Ninth Circuit panel in Cano tried to have there be limits based on whether the search that occurred is consistent with what a search for contraband would look like. And that's this abstract hypothetical question of like, you know, watching the video and saying like, does that appear to be a search for contraband or does that appear to be a search for something else? Like how on earth can you tell the difference? So uh, I, I, I think I think Cano showed how unworkable the both the manual forensic line is and also how you kind of are stuck with either no rights or full rights. You can do cause, but you can't do kind of cause and then tailor it in some way. Um, and, and, and so um, I think ultimately that's, a lot of these, I think of all these lower court cases as ultimate sort of fodder for the Supreme Court to ponder what to do. And so it's 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 useful from you know what Supreme Court um, practitioners would call a percolation perspective of having lower courts try different things and you maybe some of them make you kind of head scratching, others seem pretty persuasive, but hopefully this is all useful for when the issue gets to the Supreme Court and they can hopefully learn from what the lower courts did and see what might make more sense or less sense. Uh, second question on cases, less of a cold call question, more of a Europe view. Um, this person is curious if you could talk about your least favorite SCOTUS and or uh, Ninth Circuit crim pro ruling. Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's, 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 that, that, how long do we have? With, do we, are we here until next Tuesday to uh, uh, do this? Um, I don't know. That, that, off the top of my head, that one's hard. I'll, 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 I'll tell you the case that popped into my head that's always driven me crazy, which is one that no one's ever heard of. Um, I think it's called, I, the fact that I can't quite remember the name shows that it's not, not that serious. But um, there was a case, I think it's Lee versus Florida that occurred in 1968. Uh, and it was a statutory wiretapping case where the Supreme Court had had a prior rule about the scope of remedies under uh, the Communications Act, which is like the pre-Wiretap Act, Wiretap Act. And Congress was um, uh, uh, considering a new Wiretap Act 
and the Supreme Court overturned its prior statutory president precedent in order to what sure looked like they were trying to influence debates on the Wiretap Act. And it was one of these decisions where it's just, and I think, uh, uh, you know, if I recall correctly, Justice Harlan dissented to something like, what are we doing? This is, you know, and, and it was one of those, it was one of those one-off decisions, which, which didn't seem to have a broader principle other than let's like change some things around to get some good results while we're at it. But um, that that is about as uh, 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 unknown an example as I think you can probably get. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. For, Professor Weisberg, can I uh, ask you to weigh in on your your vote on the worst case? Stri strife or strife? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think you're muted. Sorry, it's not a digital case, but uh... That's okay. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, Utah versus Streif, I, I think, has to be in the Hall of Fame for, uh, let me put it euphemistically, uh, troubling, intellectually troubling decisions, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that would be pretty high on my list as well, I think. Okay. Um, of, course there are, of course, there are people in the country and in the courts who would say, oh, how about Matt versus Ohio? So it's obviously <laughs> a matter of point of view, so. Um. An additional question on a totally kind of uh, separate uh, topic um, is pretty specific and I'll, I'll ask it. Um, can the government make physical copies of paper records at the border without reasonable suspicion? Yeah, I would imagine they can. There aren't any cases on it, but they're allowed to search it. They're allowed to seize it. They're allowed to do anything with it. So I would imagine that it assumes digital copies are okay. There actually is kind of a really interesting um, underlying point here, which is a lot of times in the digital settings, people will, the, the question becomes, well, how have we dealt with analogous physical facts? And the answer often is we've never had cases on the analogous physical facts. And so if, if the physical fact cases ever arose, they would actually try to resolve them by analysis of the digital <laughs> cases that exist. <laughs> and so it's like, nice, nice try to get out of this puzzle by saying, don't we have some physical cases? Because there are so many fact patterns that are recurring in the digital world that could in theory have occurred in the physical world, but, but just didn't in any published cases. So, so I, I don't think we get too much further there. I don't have any more questions from the audience. So I'm happy to ask something sort of related, unless Professor Weisberg, I would ha be happy to defer to him. I, I'm just curious as a matter of strategy, you sort of talked a little bit about analogies and, wh and whether you think in terms of arguing these types of cases before the court, if you think it's worth drawing on analogies that it seems they might find persuasive, even though they're not, they're kind of wrong or they're misleading or they're unhelpful in some situations as a question of like, from, from wearing your academic hat that you maybe wouldn't want to, to advance. So how do you deal with the courts? I guess another way of putting this is how do you deal with the courts sort of, and, our, and all of our, as legal thinkers, our kind of preference for analogic reasoning, even when it might not be the best way to go about trying to think through new questions and, and relate them to existing doctrine? I think some amount of reliance on analogies is inevitable in that we're, we naturally, use analogies to just make sense of something new and root it in the old. And the important part is to just not get lost in the analogy or, or to realize that although the analogy might explain a little bit, this is actually something new. Uh, and I was heartened by Riley's sort of adoption of that thinking. You know, they, that there's the line in Riley that um, I guess the government had said searching a cell phone incident to arrest was just like searching the crumpled cigarette package in Robinson and, and, and the um, court's response was something like that's, you know, saying like going on a horse ride from A to B is like going on a trip to the moon. Um, they're both ways of getting from one place to another, but other than that, they're completely different and we need to rest the rule on its own bottom. And I think that's, that's a really good response that will be trotted out by anyone responding to an analogy in a future computer search case that you, you you have to look at the dynamics of that kind of new fact and not assume it's going to be the same as the old facts. Um, and, and so, um, I, I, again, I'm sort of heart, heartened by the Supreme Court's dealing with that issue in, in Riley and recognizing that, that analogies can be used but have their limits. 
since we've mentioned Riley a couple of times, I just have to applaud Jeff Fisher and the Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic for their really excellent work on on that case. Um, yeah, he was terrific. I, I feel like I, I almost I almost said that uh, whenever Jeff Fisher litigates <laughs> the next computer search case, I hope he will make that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, Warren, I should mention that. Uh, uh, Jeff and I often joke, uh, and I, I tell him, you know, Jeff, you have the easy job. You just have to <laughs> win the cases. I have to figure out what they mean, ultimately. <laughs> I see we have another question from the audience, uh, which is, what's the next digital case that they should take? Poll cameras, drone surveillance, what would you pick? Yeah, I think poll cameras, they probably want to wait a little bit longer. They just turned down a big cert petition on that from the uh, from Tuggle and I guess the Seventh Circuit. Um, uh, I think they should do probably the um, decryption under the Fifth Amendment pretty soon. That one's ready. Um, and um, uh, there's also a really interesting split on how the private search reconstruction doctrine applies to the um, uh, to digital files, uh, and that one's ready to go. We just need another, another case. Um, they've been, now there's like four or five circuits that have waited and it's a hopeless division, a total mess. Um, so they should, they should do that one soon too. There's, there's actually, there's a bunch of them and it's particularly ironic in a term when it has no fourth amendment cases, this term There's total, <laughs> I have nothing to do for the whole year, pretty much. Um, but, but, uh, but there's, there's, five or six circuit splits on digital search issues alone that really are calling out for resolution. So, so we're going to be seeing a whole bunch of these, um, I think, happening qu quite soon. Um, so stay tuned. And, and just for our students who might be listening, if they're interested in following these sorts of issues beyond reading your work, what would you recommend that they do? Um, Let's see. I mean, there are a lot of great law review articles on these on these issues. A lot of uh, a lot of scholarship has addressed this stuff. Um, there are a lot of organizations. Uh, EFF has a, a lot of Electronic Frontier Foundation um, has a lot of stuff on their website about issues that they're litigating and cases that are being decided. So um, fortunately, this is a field that um, tends to attract attention from the media and from organizations. So, so there's a lot out there just, just to look around for, for case updates and the like of, of the field. Um, Professor Weisberg, would you like to ask any final questions or offer any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Oh, I think you might Got be it. Just to, uh, just to thank Oren again for some just really uh, intriguing new insights. And I must say, uh, among the many great things you said today, the business, uh, we need a name for this. Would be this be reverse equilibrium adjustment? I just think that's wonderful. The, the point about, you know, in response to about the copying of the papers that we may have to reverse engineer. I'm really botching my metaphors here, or, you know, from the digital cases back to the uh, the non-digital cases, I just think is a wonderful insight. But I'll leave it to you whether they, you can come up with a good mechanical engineering title for the next article. <laughs> Yes, I will. Uh, uh, in honor of Stanford, I'll try to, my Stanford education. I'll try to come up with something that used some of the graduate level uh, engineering uh, that I did and see, see if I can do better than equilibrium adjustment. Uh, I also just want to say uh, another great thing. I mean, you know, uh, where some knowledge of technology really informs things. So, you know, years ago, we were talking about metadata and you know, mapping that on to the phone number stuff and assuming that there was a uh, just a very clear division. And then we had a lot of tech smart, you know, legal scholars who pointed out, well, that division doesn't make any sense. There's so much content in the header and so on uh, and, and so on. And I, I just analogize, you should pardon the word analogize to that. What I thought was a really interesting insight, uh, which you, you needed your background to, uh, to, ha to, uh, to achieve. And that is deconstructing, if I may use a literary term, the, the manual versus forensic thing, because it's so technologically naive now. It's so obsolete. I just think that's a, a great thought. Thanks. Yeah, and this is one area for all the, the lawyers out there. Um, you know, talk to technologists. And, yeah. and so many great, so many insights, not that these are, I don't think they're great, but so many insights you can have about the technological world is just, you know, 
sit down with technologists and ask them, does this make sense? Does that make right. sense? Does that work? Does this work? What are the trends? Um, and this is true not only with technologists, but people working uh, uh, in, the, in the internet space generally. Um, you know, the more you talk to non-lawyer tech people about the world they're seeing, you don't need to know it at the level of detail that they know. You don't need to really get into the, to the weeds of it. But being comfortable with the technology and being able to get the basic insights from the folks that are doing this every day, and then being able to think like, how does that fit into the law? That could be a, a powerful combination. That is an excellent point to wrap up on. Um, and I would hope that all of you would join me in a virtual round of applause for Professor Oren Kerr and a wonderful talk. Um, before we wrap, I just want to let everyone know this is our last event for the quarter. So best of luck to everyone on their finals. Have a wonderful spring break. And when you come back on April 4th, we have an online event for you at 5 p.m. on voter suppression and other threats to democracy with Professor Alan Abramowitz. So we hope you join us for that. And um, otherwise, have a great night, everyone. All right. Thanks so much.